the fourth and final section of the misplaced battleship by harry harrison this librivox recording is in the public domain section four when we were alone he was anything but courteous to me having assured himself by not too subtle questioning that i was a spurious admiral there was no doubt i was still in charge but our relationship was anything but formal this tripe and nonsense i told him is the bait that will snag our fish a trap for pepe and his partner in crime who is this mysterious billionaire me i said i've always wanted to be rich but this ship the space yacht where is it being built now in the naval shipyard at udridi we're almost ready to go there now soon as this batch of instructions goes out captain Sting dropped his releases onto the table then carefully wiped his hands off to remove any possible infection. He was trying to be fair and considerate of my views, and not succeeding in the slightest. "'It doesn't make sense,' he growled. "'How can you be sure this killer will ever read one of those things? And if he does, why should he be interested? It looks to me as if you are wasting time while he slips through your fingers. The alarm should be out and every ship notified.' The Navy alerted and patrols set on all space lanes, which he could easily avoid by going around, or better yet, not even bothering about, since he can lick any ship we have. That's not the answer, I told him. This Pepe is smart and as tricky as a fixed gambling machine. That's his strength and his weakness as well. Characters like that never think it possible for someone else to outthink them, which is what I'm going to do. Modest, aren't you? Sting said. I try not to be, I told him. False modesty is the refuge of the incompetent. I'm going to catch this thug, and I'll tell you how I'll do it. He's going to hit again soon, and wherever he hits there will be some kind of a periodical with my plant in it. Whatever else he is after, he's going to take all of the magazines and papers he can find, partly to satisfy his own ego but mostly to keep track of the things he is interested in, such as ship sailings. You're just guessing. You don't know all this. His automatic assumption of my incompetence was beginning to get me annoyed. I bridled my temper and tried one last time. Yes, I'm guessing, an informed guess, but I do know some facts as well. Ogget's dream was cleaned out of all reading matter. That was one of the first things I checked. We can't stop the battleship from attacking again, but we can see to it that the time after that she sails into a trap. I don't know, the captain said. It sounds to me like— I never heard what it sounded like, which is all right since he was getting under my skin and might have been tempted to pull my pseudo-rank. The alarm sirens cut his sentence off, and we foot-raced to the communications room. Captain Sting won by a nose. It was his ship, and he knew all the shortcuts. The Psyman was holding out a transcription, but he summed it up in one sentence. He looked at me while he talked, and his face was hard and cold. They hit again, knocked out a Navy supply satellite, thirty-four men dead. If your plan doesn't work, Admiral, the captain whispered hoarsely in my ear, I'll personally see that you're flayed alive. If my plan doesn't work, Captain, there won't be enough of my skin left to pick up with a tweezer. Now, if you please, I'd like to get to you ready and pick up my ship as soon as possible. The easy-going hatred and contempt of all my associates had annoyed me, thrown me off balance. I was thinking with anger now, not with logic. Forcing a bit of control, I ordered my thoughts, checking off a mental list. "'Belay that last command,' I shouted, getting back into my old space-dog mood. "'Get a call through first and find out if any of our plants were picked up during the raid.' While the Psyman unfocused his eyes and mumbled under his breath, I riffled some papers, relaxed and cool. The ratings and officers waited tensely, and made some slight attempt to conceal their hatred of me. It took about ten minutes to get an answer. "'Affirmative,' the Psyman said. A storeship docked there twenty hours before the attack. Among other things, it left newspapers containing the article. Very good, I said calmly. 
send a general order to suspend all future activity with the planted releases, send it by Simon only, no mention on any other naval signaling equipment. There's a good chance now it might be overheard. I strolled out slowly, in command of the situation, keeping my face turned away so they couldn't see the cold sweat. It was a fast run to Uridi, where my billionaire's yacht, the El Dorado, was waiting. The dockyard commander showed me the ship, and made a noble effort to control his curiosity. I took a sadistic revenge on the Navy by not telling him a word about my mission. After checking out the controls and special apparatus with the technicians, I cleared the ship. There was a tape in the automatic navigator that would put me on the course mentioned in all the articles. Just a press of a button and I would be on my way. I pressed the button. It was a beautiful ship, and the dockyard had been lavished with their attention to detail. From bow to rear tubes she was plated in pure gold. There are other metals with a higher albedo, but none that gives a richer effect. All the fittings, inside and out, were either machine-turned or plated. All this work could not have been done in the time allotted. The Navy must have adapted a luxury yacht to my needs. Everything was ready. Either Pepe would make his move, or I would sail on to my billionaire's paradise planet. If that happened, it would be best if I stayed there. Now that I was in space, past the point of no return, all the doubts that I had dismissed fought for attention. The plan that had seemed so clear and logical now began to look like a patched and crazy makeshift. Hold on there, sailor, I said to myself, using my best admiral's voice. Nothing has changed. It's still the best and only plan possible under the circumstances. Was it? Could I be sure that Pepe, flying his mountain of a ship and eating navy rations, would be interested in some of the comforts and luxuries of life? Or if the luxuries didn't catch his eye, would he be interested in the planetary homesteading gear? I had loaded the cards with all the things he might want, and planted the information where he could get it. He had the bait now, but would he grab the hook? I couldn't tell and I could work myself into a neurotic state if I kept running through the worry cycle. It took an effort to concentrate on anything else, but it had to be made. The next four days passed very slowly. When the alarm blew off, all I felt was an intense sensation of relief. I might be dead and blasted to dust in the next few minutes, but that didn't seem to make much difference. Pepe had swallowed the bait. There was only one ship in the galaxy that could knock back a blip that big at such a distance. It was closing fast, using the raw energy of the battleship engines for a headlong approach. My ship bucked a bit as the tug beams locked on at maximum distance. The radio bleeped at me for attention at the same time. I waited as long as I dared, then flipped it on. The voice boomed out. That you are under the guns of a warship, don't attempt to run, signal, take evasive action, or in any other way. Who are you and what the devil do you want? I sputtered into the mic. I had my scanner on so they could see me, but my own screen stayed dark. They weren't sending any picture. In a way it made my act easier. I just played to an unseen audience. They could see the rich cut of my clothes, the luxurious cabin behind me, of course they couldn't see my hands. It doesn't matter who we are, the radio boomed again. Just obey orders if you care to live. Stay away from the controls until we have tied on, then do exactly as I say. There were two distant clangs as magnetic grapples hit the hull. A little later the ship lurched, drawn home against the battleship. I let my eyes roll in fear, looking around for a way to escape and taking a peek at the outside scanners. The yacht was flush against the space-filling bulk of the other ship. I pressed the button that sent the torch-wielding robot on his way. Now let me tell you something, I snapped into the mic, wiping away the worried billionaire expression. First I'll repeat your own warning. Obey orders if you want to live. I'll show you why. When I threw the big switch, a carefully worked-out sequence took place. 
First, of course, the hull was magnetized, and the bombs fused. A light blinked as the scanner in the cabin turned off, and the one in the generator room came on. I checked the monitor screen to make sure, then started into the spacesuit. It had to be done fast, at the same time it was necessary to talk naturally. They must think of me as sitting in the control room. That's the ship's generators you're looking at, I said. Ninety-eight percent of their output is now feeding into coils that make an electromagnet of this ship's hull. You will find it very hard to separate us, and I would advise you not to try. The suit was on, and I kept the running chatter up through the mic in the helmet, relaying to the ship's transmitter. The scene in the monitor receiver changed. You are now looking at a hydrogen bomb that is primed and aware of the magnetic field holding our ships together. It will, of course, go off if you try to pull away. I grabbed up the monitor receiver and ran towards the airlock. This is a different bomb now, I said, keeping one eye on the screen and the other on the slowly opening outer door. This one has receptors on the hull. Attempt to destroy any part of this ship, or even gain entry to it, and this one will detonate. I was in space now, leaping across to the gigantic wall of the other ship. What do you want? These were the first words Pepe had spoken since his first threats. I want to talk to you, arrange a deal, something that would be profitable for both of us. But let me first show you the rest of the bombs, so you won't get any strange ideas about cooperating. Of course, I had to show him the rest of the bombs. There was no getting out of it. The scanners in the ship were following a planned program. I made light talk about all my massive armament that would carry us both to perdition while I climbed through the hole in the battleship's hull. There was no armor or warning devices at this spot. It had been chosen carefully from the blueprints. Yeah, yeah, I take your word for it. You're a flying bomb. So stop with this roving report a bit and tell me what you have in mind. This time I didn't answer him, because I was running and panting like a dog and had the mic turned off. Just ahead, if the blueprints were right, was the door to the control room. Pepe should be there. I stepped through, gun out, and pointed it at the back of his head. Angelina stood next to him, looking at the screen. The game's over, I said. Stand up slowly and keep your hands in sight. What do you mean? he said angrily, looking at the screen in front of him. The girl caught Wise first. She spun around and pointed. He's here. They both stared, gaped at me, caught off guard and completely unprepared. You're under arrest, Crime King, I told him, and your girlfriend. Angelina rolled her eyes up and slid slowly to the floor. Real or faked, I didn't care. I kept the gun on Pepe's pudgy form while he picked her up and carried her to an acceleration couch against the wall. What, what will happen now? He quavered the last question. His pouchy jaws shook, and I swear there were tears in his eyes. I was not impressed by his acting, since I could clearly remember the dead men floating in space. He stumbled over to a chair, half dropping into it. Will they do anything to me? Angelina asked. Her eyes were open now. I have no idea what will happen to you, I told her truthfully. That is up to the courts to decide. But he made me do all those things, she wailed. She was young, dark, and beautiful. The tears did nothing to spoil this. Pepe dropped his face into his hands, and his shoulders shook. I flicked the gun his way and snapped at him. Sit up, Pepe. I find it very hard to believe that you are crying. There are some naval ships on the way now. The automatic alarm was triggered about a minute ago. I'm sure they'll be glad to see the man who— Don't let them take me, please! Angelina was on her feet now, her back pressed to the wall. They'll put me in prison, do things to my mind. She shrunk away as she spoke, stumbling along the wall. I looked back at Pepe, not wanting to have my eyes off him for an instant. There's nothing I can do, I told her. I glanced her way, and a small door was swinging open, and she was gone. Don't try to run, I shouted after her. It can't do any good. Pepe made a strangling noise, and I looked back to him quickly. He was sitting up now, and his face was dry of tears. In fact, he was laughing, not crying. 
So she caught you, too, Mr. Wise Cop. Poor little Angelina with the soft eyes. He broke down again, shaking with laughter. What do you mean? I growled. Don't you catch on yet? The story she told you was true, except she twisted it around a bit. The whole plan, building the battleship, then stealing it, was hers. She pulled me into it, played me like an accordion. I fell in love with her, hating myself and happy at the same time. Well, I'm glad now it's over. At least I gave her a chance to get away. I owe her that much. Though I thought I would explode when she went into that innocence act. The cold feeling was now a ball of ice that threatened to paralyze me. You're lying, I said hoarsely, and even I didn't believe it. Sorry, that's the way it is. Your brain boys will pick my skull to pieces and find out the truth anyway. There's no point in lying now. We'll search the ship. She can't hide for long. She won't have to, Pepe said. There's a fast scout we picked up, stowed in one of the holes. That must be it leaving now. We could feel the vibration distantly through the floor. The Navy will get her, I told him, with far more conviction than I felt. Maybe he said, suddenly slumped and tired, no longer laughing. Maybe they will, but I gave her her chance. It's all over for me now, but she knows that I loved her to the end. He bared his teeth in sudden pain. Not that she will care in the slightest. I kept the gun on him, and neither of us moved while the Navy ships pulled up and their boots stamped outside. I had captured my battleship and the raids were over and I couldn't be blamed if the girl had slipped away. If she evaded the Navy ships, that was their fault, not mine. I had my victory all right. Then why did it taste like ashes in my mouth? It's a big galaxy, but it wasn't going to be big enough to hide Angelina now. I can be conned once, but only once. The next time we meet, things were going to be very different. End of section four. End of the misplaced battleship by Harry Harrison. This story was read by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, April 2012.